Hey there, everyone. Welcome to today's session. We are here for our next session in the Going the Distance with Video series. This is a free webinar series brought to you by CBC and At One. We've got seven sessions in the series, and this is number three, and we're really, really excited about all of them. Um, this one is, is really special because we're here to center student voices, and we are joined today by Martez Apigo. Uh, who's DE coordinator, OER coordinator, and English professor at Contra Costa College, and Denise Maduli williams who is professor of English and ESOL at San Diego Miramar College. And I have to mention that um, I learn so much from these two every time I'm with them. And even when I'm not with them, I follow them on Twitter and I'm always learning from them. And Maritez and Denise are also two of our phenomenal course facilitators for At One. So I want to acknowledge that um, that extra hard work that they that they bring to our system and their dedication to sharing their passion for for equitable online teaching. So you're in for a real treat today. And by the way, I'm Michelle Pekansky Brock. I'm your host, and I will kind of be in the background today. And I'm going to turn it over to our uh, wonderful speakers now. Um, and again, reminder, if you have questions for Martez or Denise, put them in the Q&A, and we're going to get to those at the end of the session today, okay? So for now, I'm going to go away and and, and pass it over to uh, Denise and Martez. Thank you, Thank you so you, much. <laughs> Always such a nice, warm welcome. Oh my goodness. And thank you to everyone who's here today. Um, it's so wonderful to see some friends we know and many new people. We really appreciate you joining us. And both of us are really excited um, to share today. Yes. So um, I'm Denise and Michelle did a great job introducing us. <laughs> so I'm gonna just hop right into it, into our first slide. Okay, great. So to get us just warmed up, we want to invite you to share in the chat. Um, and <clears throat> the question that we are going to respond to is why are stories important to our lives? It's going by so quickly, but I saw some things in there about how it helps us connect with others, how it adds meaning to our lives, um, and um, how we can share experiences with one another. They're part of our culture. Um, they add empathy and help us understand each other. Yes. And so, you know, if you're like me, you love and you enjoy hearing a good story. Storytelling really helps humans understand others and ourselves. We feel empathy with characters and it really creates cognitive and emotional connections with others. It helps us build trust with one another and it makes information memorable. Storytelling really shapes our perspective of the world. Okay, thank you everyone for adding and feel free to just keep on adding in the chat. We both have our eye on it throughout. So um, before we get started on our examples and our work, we wanted to begin with those educators and leaders whose perspectives have framed our pedagogy, our teaching, our learning, um, and who you see here. These are the equity-minded, asset-based lenses through which we value and center student voices. So we wanna take a moment to just reflect on some of the important things that we've learned from them. Go ahead and throw up a heart reaction. If you've watched Chimamanda Adichie's TED Talk on the danger of the single story. Oh, here come the hearts. Oh my gosh, so many of you already have. Yes, in fact, she's received over 30 million views of her TED Talk, where she warns us of the danger of centering a single dominant Eurocentric narrative. And she highlights in her TED Talk that stories matter, 
Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. At a past online teaching conference keynote, Dr. Luke Wood, he shared with us the five Bs, including these two, be relational, be community centric. Relationship building happens and trust develops when we listen to our students' stories. We foster a classroom community by allowing students to share their stories with one another as well. And in Zaretta Hammond's Ready for Rigor framework, in the section on information processing, she explains, help students process new content using methods from oral traditions. Connect new content to culturally relevant examples and metaphors from students' community and everyday lives. So as instructors, we can seek ways to draw from our students' lives, their communities, their stories, and connect those to our course content. Students come to us with so many assets, life experience, narrative, cultures, and backgrounds. So let's capitalize off of that and let's amplify their voices. Now, as you saw in the introduction, um, Martez and I both teach English and ESOL. Um, and while that means we focus very much on improving or helping students improve their academic English skills um, and all those other skills they need to be successful, we know that there's something much deeper and more meaningful in the way that we approach our work. Um, and Dr. Goldie Muhammad, who wrote Cultivating Genius and whose newest book, Cultivating Joy, is out right now, um, says this. It is our job as educators to not just teach skills, but also to teach students to validate and celebrate who they are. Um, and this to me is one of the joys of centering student stories, hearing um, the student stories and the way that they can connect with each other and for them to know that their stories really do matter and that we value them. So this is something that I have barely scratched the surface into the research on, um, but it is fascinating in terms of how storytelling affects the brain. Um, and if you just take a look at these four components here, I just find it so integral to understanding that it's not just, um, you know, it's not just for fun, although it is for fun, there's a deeper connection happening here with our brain. So neural coupling allows the listener to turn the story they hear into their own ideas and experiences. So we're not just listening in it, into it to stories in an abstract way. Um, something so fascinating when I look at this is that in mirroring, um, listeners experience similar brain activity, not just with each other, but with the speaker. So our brains are actually connecting. And if you look this up, you'll see the actual, you know, kind of brain waves and how the listeners and speakers are activated in the same way at the same time during storytelling. Um, the brain releases dopamine and then also many areas of the cortex are engaged. So in terms of the power of storytelling and how it affects the brain, it really is phenomenal. So now let's just go ahead and get into um, our student video stories. We're really excited with what we have to share with you. So just quickly about me, um, I'm teaching credit ELAC, English Language Acquisition at Miramar College, which is our term for um, English as a second or other language. Um, I'm also teaching English composition and I teach these in all, mo all modalities. Right now I have my ELAC advanced course in person um, and I have my English composition classes online, but it's important to know that digital storytelling and the experiences and the examples we're showing are not aligned with any specific modality. Martez and I have used these examples um, in person, hybrid, online asynchronous, online remote, all the different ways that we use to call these different settings. It's not tied to any one particular type of course. Okay, so the first example that I want to show is really how I have students enter into our class. 
So in terms of the first activity that I do with my students, whether that is an in-person class or an online class, is I ask them to share something with this topic of what would you hold? Um, and this is in place of the kind of more traditional introduce yourself to your neighbor or tell us a little bit about yourself in the discussion boards. And it asks students to think of something that they can hold in their hands that they will carry with them always something that is not expensive, but is priceless. Um, something that they may have carried from their countries, may have come with them through generations and that they will keep close to them and then hand down to others. And I used to always do this as a writing activity. Students would write about it. Um, maybe they would post on a Padlet, but I have turned to doing it with voice um, and as a digital story. Um, in the example, I will show you it's with Flip because there's something in the power of the human voice that makes it just more, more powerful for students at the beginning. It's a way for them to really share themselves. I also really, really want them to put it in their hands and take a photo and show it because there's also something so special of seeing this object in, in their hands. So these are real student examples here. Those are just kind of screenshots from um, a Padlet. Um, this is what it looks like on my canvas shell. Um, I use Flip for this for a number of reasons. One is that at Miramar in our district, it's embedded within Canvas, so students don't have to create a separate account. I'm always mindful of technology tools and asking students to have multiple accounts. Um, Flip now also has um, automatic captioning, so these are accessible um, for all students to see when they record them, and they are also editable, the captions. Um, and also, it doesn't ask students to show their face. So I do love videos of students' faces. And when I make videos, I often, I almost always use my face. But I think for that very first step, if you're in an online class or you're in an in-person class, that's a, that could be a barrier for students. And there's something really wonderful about hearing the voices, but being able to see the object. And you're just getting like a toe step in to video stories without right away asking students, like make a full video with your face and share it with strangers that you don't know yet. So this is um, the actual um, prompt that students have. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and show um, one example. Um, this is the screenshot of the student. So when they go to the flip grid, it's so fun to see it populate because you just start to see all these hands holding these objects and you don't know what they are. And so you start, you start to click on them and you just hear amazing stories. So I'm gonna share one. Um, and I believe the captions are on. I'll make sure they're on when I play it. Give me a thumbs up, Martez, to make sure you can hear it. Hey, guys. My presentation is about and my grandfather, but also helped me to be a better person in my life. Thank you for listening to me. Hey, guys. My presentation is about an important object that I have never left behind. There is always something that reminds us about an important person in our lives. It could be a memory, a place, or even an object. When I was a child, I had a good relationship with my grandfather. He was very kind to me and taught me valuable lessons about life. When I was 15 years old, he gave me one of the most memorable and meaningful gifts of my life. He got me a pendant symbolizing the great Persian empire as a birthday gift. Besides its mon monetary value, this pendant has significant and sentimental value to me. The name of this symbol, symbol is Farvahar. As you can see in the picture, Farvahar is depicted as a winged guardian angel. The wings uh, contains the most significant meaning of this symbol. There are two wings in either sides of Farvahar, each having three main feathers. These main feathers uh, represent uh, three symbols of good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. The lower part of Farvahar contains uh, three feathers representing bad reflection, bad words, and bad deeds, which causes misery for human beings. In my opinion, these symbols represent a guideline for humanity. 
It can help people to be more kind to each other. In conclusion, this gift not only reminds me my childhood and my grandfather, but also helped me to be a better person in my life. Thank you for listening to me. So that's just one example. I, I, you never know what students are going to bring and you hear so many amazing things about what's important to them. We learn a different aspect of their background than uh, instead of just asking them to tell them about themselves um, and what they might bring. The other thing that I really, really like about this introduction and doing digital stories in this way, even in an in-person class, is that it's an equitable way for all students to share their experiences. So every student has a voice and every student's voice is heard. So the student told me that they had to record it multiple times, right, until he really felt comfortable sharing it. But now he has a full two minutes where he's really shared something that's important to him. And when you go to the Flipgrid, you hear every single person's story. Everyone has airtime. You can hear it in their own way at their own time. And they're able to share whatever they feel comfortable sharing. The other example here is that um, the other reason why I like Flip is because now, or it's been a while now, you can comment uh, within videos. So in this particular video, then another student commented um, and she actually came on video to comment. So not only are we having students just beginning with sharing something important to them as an artifact, but then other students are so excited to hear and see what they have that they're just hopping on their cameras um, and wanting to connect and say hello and express um, you know, their gratitude for hearing about their story, make connections, see where they have something similar. And it just grows and grows in a way that I think is so powerful. When I flip back here, you can just kind of see what that looks like as students come in to the Flipgrid and start to share their own, um, their own digital stories of what they would hold. The next example um, I want to talk about is something that I do later on in the class. Um, and we in my ELAC 145 class read um, Faruza Dumas' um, memoir called um, Funny and Farsi. And in it, in her afterwards, she says, every person has a story and every story matters. And she's writing about this in the sense that people were asking her like, well, why are you writing a memoir? What have you accomplished? What have you done? Um, and in the end, she says, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I've done. Every person has a story and every story matters. And that's what I start with this for my students. Um, so this is, you know, kind of early on in the semester, but it's not the first activity. So they have already gained some um, confidence in meeting each other and, and their academic English skills. So I actually use the Pixar story spine. So if you go to Khan Academy and look up, you know, Pixar story spine, this is the Pixar movie storyline that every single Pixar movie follows um, in their movies. So I tell students that and we like look at some examples of the movies and then I say, and now you are going to create your own story. And their story is how they came to Miramar College. So everyone's is the same once upon a time every day until one day, because of that, because of that, because of that, until finally I came here to Miramar College and ever since then. So in the real story spine, it, uh, the, until finally is just blank. But what I did was add in the Miramar College so that we can all find out, like, what is your story in terms of how you got here? Um, so I love doing this because it mirrors the writing process. I don't start off by telling students, you're going to make a digital story and we're going to have to use all this technology. I say we're going to write our stories and we're going to share them. And then they just have a very simple story spine um, and all they have to do is complete the sentences. Um, and that is very accessible for students of any language level so they can write as much or as little as they want. They can share whatever they feel comfortable with or not. So we just write first. Um, and then I explained to them that we are then going to use Adobe Express to create a video story. Um, and I do that because I don't want them to get concerned about the end of product. I want them to think about their story first. I also um, use Adobe Express for this for multiple reasons. It is um, something that is free. 
Um, we, they can use it on their computers, but it's also a mobile app that they can use on their phones and their tablets. And I don't use any technology for digital storytelling that is not able for students to use on their phones because many students are just using that to complete their work. Um, they also have photos and videos that are already included as part of it so that they can use um, without having to, you know, go grab Google images if they don't want to use their own personal images. Uh, but the magic in this is that they can record their voices easily um, and that they can add music and then the, and then it just magically turns it into a video story behind the scenes. So they're working step by step on the slides and then it comes together into a story. Um, so I'm going to show you one example. We I've been doing this for years, but this is like the one of the first years I ever did it. One of my favorite stories um, and I will just play it for you now. My name is Peng, and this is my story. Every day, I felt happy to be born and grow up in Hanoi, a beautiful city of Vietnam. I even planned to stay there for the rest of my life, like my parents. Until one day, I fell in love with a guy at college, and we got married. Because of that, when he got a job offer by UCSD, I decided to follow my heart and move with him to the States, where our little angel was born. Because of that, I had to stay at home to take care of the baby full time. Because of that, what I did all day was just housework and baby stuff. So I lost all the English and the working skills which I once had. Until finally, I started taking classes at Miramar College. And ever since then, I have been trying my best to improve my English, broaden my knowledge, so that one day I will become a scientist to fight disease and save lives. Okay, and and kind of the workflow for that is that if I have an in person class, I kind of model making one in class, I have my own that I show them, and then we troubleshoot if needed in person. Um, in my online classes, I have uh, plenty of videos where I walk through making them, and they're able to watch that. Um, and then I, I, you know, I have online office hours if anyone needs troubleshooting live. Um, the way that I have students share them is on a Padlet. So then um, after everyone creates their stories, it's shared on a class Padlet so they can easily view and comment on each other's stories. Um, and that was Adobe Express, formerly Adobe Spark. Adobe Spark, right? I can't like everything change, so I'm a little confused. Okay, um, let's see. The next thing I wanna show and kind of the last thing is the story of the semester, right? So I kind of have digital um, photo stories or digital storytelling infused throughout the semester. So we use Flip for lots of different things. Um, I like to do Adobe, uh, I almost said Adobe Spark, Adobe Express for um, the My Story videos. I also have them do um, kind of um, book reviews and things like that. But at the end, they also do a digital portfolio. And we use Adobe Express for digital portfolios um, and they create a web page. But instead of having them write their final reflection, I have them do a semester reflection video. So the question then is, what's the story of your semester? What happened over these 16 weeks? Um, and this reflection video takes the place of a traditional portfolio statement, which is often kind of, um, you know, a long introductory statement reflecting on the course and, and introducing the portfolio. So instead I have them make a video um, and I ask them exactly this, explain the writing pieces that you've included in your portfolio, reflect on your progress, improvement, challenges, and learning this semester. So by this time, we're not actually having to deal with how to use um, Adobe Express or the technology, they're familiar with that. They're able to reflect on their progress and then share that um, through, um, through video. My Zoom things moved. Let me. Okay. So I'm going to move over to this is an example of one of the students' portfolios. 
Um, and so I'm gonna move down. And so she just has the video reflection as her first component. Um, and in terms of these, these, this example is from a couple years back. It is not captioned. So sometimes in the past, I would have students complete the video reflections and then just sub submit them to me, um, to the instructor. So it's just coming to me. It, it um, didn't need to be accessible for the entire class to complete the project. Um, other times I have had students share on the discussion board or in small groups or digital portfolios, and then they're able to view and enjoy each other's, um, but they're not accessing this content to complete assignments just to be clear on that. So I'm going to um, just play Sayo's um, reflection video. Building My Confidence by Hisayo Johnson. This semester was my second semester, and I was nervous about this class because writing is my least favorite thing to do in any language. Grammar was always challenging for me, but after learning fanboys and article, I started to get better with my grammar. This class also helped me to improve my vocabularies. After I learned new vocabularies in class, I tried to use them or tried to find the words outside of the class, especially when I'm watching TV or listening to the radio. It helped me to learn more academic words and how native speakers use them. The best thing I learned in this class is how to build an essay. Learning how to brainstorm, sketch, and making outlines to start essay will help me to write essays in other classes in the future. My proudest piece in my portfolio is called Challenge, Be Excited. It is my proudest piece because it was my most challenging essay for me. I had a hard time reasoning my points using example from funny in Farsi. Even though it was challenging for me, I did not give up. Timed essay was nerve-wracking, but I was very proud to hear when professor read my timed essay as a good example. That made my day. Almost every day, we wrote a journal. Surprisingly, I started to enjoy writing it. It was a good practice for me and I could feel myself improving each time I wrote a journal. I included two of my journals about the success and a Halloween story. Having a reading group and forum post on the discussion board helped me to understand the book Funny in Farsi better. I thought it is a great idea to have reading groups in a lack class because it was interesting to see other opinions from students who grew up in different cultures. Throughout this semester, this class motivated me to learn more, and I have had found a new challenge to learn new vocabularies. I am planning to read books throughout my winter break to learn more academic words before the next semester. So again, asking students to share the story of their semester through digital storytelling is just a really wonderful way to end the semester. And students are very creative and they're able to, you know, um, do whatever they feel most comfortable with. So this student had images of things she did during the class. Um, she had um, quotes that were, you know, um, important to her. Other students will have videos in there. They might have pictures of themselves. They might be sharing their work, but no matter how they're approaching it, they're able to share the story in a way that's best for them. Um, and it's fun for them to see each other's and listen and see what similarities there are and what themes come up. Um, but I find that for many students, being able to do that in a storytelling manner, um, in terms of a reflective assignment is is, you know, it's a nice option, especially in a writing class. So they're just doing so much heavy writing that it's nice to end um, the, the semester with telling the story themselves. So with that, thank you for listening to my portion. I'm going to stop screen sharing and hand it over to Marites um, and we'll hear more from her. Yes, thank you, Denise. I just love seeing your student examples. Um, I am going to be sharing some examples from my students 
using the same two tools that Denise just shared with you, Flip and Adobe Express Video. So I'm not gonna introduce new tools, but I'll be sharing um, some of the assignments that I, um, I have. So um, before I share some of my students' work, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background on my two classes. Um, so in, I have an English 1A class, which is kind of like a freshman composition and reading class. Um, the examples I'm gonna show you here are um, from an asynchronous online class that has a theme of, of race and social justice. So I'll share with you um, what we did, what my students did with the flip around microaggressions. And then I'm also going to share with you uh, some work from my English 1AX class, which is our intensive reading and writing or accelerated um, English class that has an ESL focus. So this is the transfer level English class that um, students um, from the ESL program come into, or we might have some generation 1.5 students in there as well. Um, and this class I've taught as both a hybrid and as an asynchronous online class. And in this class, uh, we have the theme of US immigration. And so I'm gonna go ahead and sh start sharing with you um, the flip assignment that students in my English 1A class do. And, um, and so students here read several articles on microaggressions by diverse authors representing multiple perspectives on microaggressions. And after reading, they participate in this online video discussion using FLIP. And it was formerly known as Flipgrid. You might've heard that before. Um, so this is the prompt that I give them. And I'm just gonna go ahead and go to my actual uh, FLIP. Um, and so in the prompt, I always like to give a little video just of me explaining what the prompt is. So that's what this is here. Um, but I have it here as text also. Um, I'm asking students to record a video of five minutes or less telling us first a situation when you either experienced or witnessed any kind of microaggression occur. Um, and then let us know, sorry, it just wants to advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, let us know, um, according to Daryl Wingsu's chart, like what theme would that fall under? Number two, let us know what the implied meaning is by the perpetrator. And lastly, how did it make you feel and how did you react? So what I like to do on my flips like this is I like to record an example video of myself responding to the prompt as a model for students to follow. And in Flip, you can pin your any video that you want to the top. So that's what I did here. And so students, when they enter the Flipgrid, they can see mine uh, at, at the top and, um, and watch that one first and follow the example. Um, and I like to do that because sometimes the first one, the first student who might do it may not be a good example. And then next thing you know, your class is all following. <laughs> that first student. So it's nice to have a really solid, um, strong example for them to follow. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and share with you a couple of my students' responses to that prompt, um, Brandon and Linda. And uh, my student work that I'm sharing with you um, is, is with their permission. Hello, everybody. So a situation when I experienced any kind of microaggression occur would be uh, when I was younger, I was waiting at school, waiting to get picked up by my mom and aunt. But uh, they got into a car accident and they were nearby the school. So my cousin that was with them rushed over and told me to, hey, you know, they got into a car accident, let's go, go back. And as we were going back, the police officer was taking a look at my aunt's like car registration and driver's license. And as he was uh, inspecting the driver's license, he said, hey, this looks fake to me. You guys must be illegal. And uh, when uh, we heard that, it was kind of like a surprise, you know? And according to Daryl Dwayne Sue's chart, this would fall 
under the theme of alien in one's own land, implying that as a Latino, you know, you're not a true American or a foreigner in this country. And uh, how did it make me feel and how did I react? Well, I think I was about 11 or 12 when it happened. I didn't really know how to react or what to say. I was just a little upset because the police officer was white and um, the tone that he said it and he was kind of smirking as well. Mm. Even after checking that it was a real driver's license, after that he didn't even apologize. He just left. Hello everybody. So there's one student's example. I mean, many of these students actually shared um, their uh, own firsthand experiences as victims of microaggressions. And for almost all of them, that term microaggressions is a new term to them, um, but the experiences are not new. So everyone had something to share. And I'll also share with you uh, Linda's. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing all well. Uh, my experience with microaggression was here in the US in my first work when I came here. Uh, I was working as a cashier inside a store. Uh, I was new. When the customer came in to check out, they always asking me, where are you from? Because they don't know me, I'm new inside the store. Um, I always heard a lot of answer from them. But the one day a lady, she is coming to check out and she asking me, you have an accent, where are you from? And I told her, guess where I'm from. She told me, I know you are from Europe, maybe from German or France. I told her no. I uh, nobody find nobody guess where I'm from. And then when I told her I'm from Algeria, she don't know anything from Algeria. She don't know where is it. Uh, they told me that <laughs> they told me you know the American they are really bad in geography. <laughs> so uh, she told me where is Algeria. I told her in North Africa then guess her answer she told me are you okay are you crazy that's what she told me i told her why what's the matter what's the problem with africa i was shocked with, uh, about her answer i never heard this answer from a customer i i know i always heard uh like Oh, I thought Africa, they are all black, they are all dark skin. Why you are white skin? No, North Africa, they are all white skin. They are all green eyes, blue eyes. They are not all dark skin. In um, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, they are all white skin. So I was sh shocked, I was very angry about her answer and she just laugh in and go out she didn't tell anything else so over here on the right hand side you can uh, click this dialogue button and this is where you can view the replies to um to the initial video so these are all in response to linda's video and because Linda forgot to um, explain um, how it fits into Daryl Wingsu's chart. Some of her classmates went in and kind of helped her. So, so I thought that was really nice. Um, and then other of, of her peers also um, were expressing how they can relate or how they've all also had gone through the same type of experience. So I'll just play um, a couple of these for you. Hi, Linda. People can be so desensitized to the comments that they make and act like it's okay when in fact it's not. And the theme that I would say that that falls under from Daryl Wingsu's chart is 
alien in one's own land because while consciously or unconsciously doing so, they seem to have been trying to alienate you by asking you all of those questions and making assumptions about where you're from. And hopefully people soon realize the issue in that. And here's one more. Hi, Linda. I can totally relate with you because people always ask me if I'm from Spain or Italy. And I'm just like, no, I'm not from either of those countries. Um, and actually, last semester, one of my teachers was like, she went around the classroom trying to guess everyone's ethnicity. And when she got to me, she was like, well, you have an ethnic name. But she didn't guess. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, both of my parents are from Mexico. And she was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, mm, that, that doesn't add up. And it frustrates me because the media around us feed into these stereotypes that people from certain places are supposed to look a certain way when... And that it's not true, you know. Everybody looks different. So, yeah. All right. So that is um, a couple of examples of this flip on microaggressions. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share with you another example. Um, and this is from my other class that has the U.S. immigration theme. Um, and in this class, my students are using Adobe Express videos to document their immigration stories. Um, and by the time they make these videos, it's actually the second time they're using the tool. The first time they're, they're using it in groups. They have to uh, create a group video in their book clubs as we're reading um, a book. And so, they get to kind of lean on one another to, um, you know, if they, if they run into any issues while using Adobe Express um, and work together and collaborate um, on that video. So by the time they do their own video, they've already um, are familiar with the tool and can just focus on the content. Um, so I found that to be really helpful. Um, and for this um, video, uh, it's, they're working on it over weeks. Um, they have, they're required to interview at least one person and um, conduct research. Um, they are doing multiple drafts of, of their work. So they have to draft the transcripts of what um, they are going to say out loud while they're recording their video. They do some peer review and get feedback on their drafts, and then they work through some re a re revision process. So after they have a final draft of those transcripts, then they read them aloud while they're recording their videos. And that transcript becomes the accurate closed captions on their video. So you'll see that in these two examples that I'll show you here. Um, <clears throat> okay, here we go. The Immigration Story by Sheila Suela My immigration story began when my grandfather, Modesto Briones, signed up to join the U.S. Army during the World War II, where he served as a driver to General Douglas MacArthur and a cook while he was in the Philippines. During that time, my native country was in turmoil. Because of the war, there are no certainties on the economic stability of the Philippines and many places were devastated from the adverse of the war. The Commonwealth of the Philippines was attacked by the Japanese on December 8, 1941, and nine hours later, Pearl Harbor was attacked. This is when the U.S. military recruited many Filipinos to join the U.S. Armed Forces to fight as soldiers alongside the Americans. According to my aunt, 
The soldiers who joined the U.S. military service were guaranteed U.S. citizenship and opportunity to migrate to the United States with their families after the war. This was exactly what my grandfather did after the Second World War. He grabbed the opportunity to migrate to the United States. However, my grandfather signed up to join the Industrial Merchant Marine where he worked until he retired. Although he worked in various places before he signed up to be a Merchant Marine. My brother shared the stories that our grandfather used to tell him. During his early years when he first came here in the U.S., he said, It was difficult and lonely without your grandmother and your uncle and auntie. Therefore, as soon as he was able to settle in San Francisco, he then petitioned his whole family, including my mother and her family, to come here to the U.S. and join him. According to my aunt, immigration was not as chaotic as it is now. The process was faster and easy in the U.S. after the war. This is not so for my family. When my grandfather petitioned my mother and her family, all of us should have come to the U.S. at the same time. But my younger sister fell ill when we were supposed to leave and migrate to the U.S. My mother told my father to go ahead since he has all the documents ready. He can help our family financially as soon as he was able to find employment. When we were ready to join him, the former president, the late Ferdinand Marcus, declared martial law. No one may leave the country. Our papers were withheld indefinitely. It was difficult not to be able to join our father immediately. Due to this incident, the U.S. immigration found out what happened. My father was informed there's a problem with his document. Since my mother was petitioned by grandfather, she should have come to the U.S. first instead of my father. Therefore, my father was detained and was supposed to be deported. However, my father did not know about this ruling and found an immigration lawyer to represent him. Due to this incident and martial law in the Philippines, it took 10 years before we were able to join him here in the U.S. If we were not able to come, my father would have been deported back to the Philippines. Although what happened to my family was not as intense as the undocumented immigrants go through nowadays, it is difficult having been separated from your family. Nothing can suffice the feelings of loneliness and longingness for any member of your family, especially one's parents. The only form of communication was by letter or telegram if there's any emergency. I hope and pray that our current immigration policy for undocumented immigrants may be rectified and resolved as soon as possible that no one would experience to be separated from one's family. The end. Thank you for watching. Students told me that um, by making these videos, they learned about their family history that they never knew before. Um, you know, by having to interview, many of them interviewed like grandparents or great grandparents, and they just never knew this family history. Um, other students have told me that they've shared these videos with their family. So like if they have a gathering, they'll like put it on the TV and everyone will watch it together. Um, or they'll share the link out to their family members. So it becomes like a piece of family history. Um, so those are just some side notes that came out of it um, by, by documenting these oral histories. Um, and um, also what I just wanted to share with you too is that this is a, a Canvas discussion. So when the students are finished with their videos, they share them on a Canvas discussion and then they give and receive peer feedback. So they do get to see one another's videos. And I'll just share with you uh, the first half of this one because it's quite long, um, but it's also very good about, um, about this immigration story. Hello everyone, my name is Wan. Today in this video, I will tell you guys about one story. The story about migrations of the boat people 
after the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. On April 30, 1975, the Vietnam War, or what I was taught in Vietnam as the resistance war against the Americans, was over. The army of Viet Cộng from North of Vietnam took over Saigon, the heart of Northern Vietnam. After that, they rapidly established the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to reunify over the country. The new leaders of the new government began to revenge against who had served and supported the U.S. with brutally oppressive regime. Not only punished those who served former government, they confiscated people's property and belongings with the simple reason that the country needed financial resources to recover after the war. In one night, many people became homeless, were imprisoned, or killed. Life was then extremely difficult for South Vietnamese people. As a result, a mass exodus of Vietnamese refugees, also known as boat people, risked their lives in crowded and fragile boats and fled across the ocean to other countries in search of peace, freedom, and safety. Okay, I'm going to pause it there, but she does go on to explain the whole boat journey uh, to the United States and in the end how they made it here and, and how um, how terrible the conditions were on the boat. Um, I can't even believe that people survived. So um, I think that you get the idea there, but I'm just going to go ahead and pause it here and um, switch back to our slides because we have um, some students feedback to share with you. Um, in my, my students wrote um, on some anonymous feedback surveys, um, Professor Pigo's final video project really touched my heart and I learned so much about other students in the class. I shared the video with my entire family. And another student shared that now that the class is over, she's gonna miss, um, miss, my, miss me, especially my Monday morning video greetings. Um, and that's more alluding to the videos that I produce in the class. And, and these are just two um, pieces of feedback from my ELAC students. So one said, I enjoy creating my story videos. I think when we do them, you can learn your classmates' point of view as well as tell your personality. Those my story videos are always a hit every semester with our students. Um, and then another student in my online asynchronous class said the projects in this class make me feel like I'm not in an online class. It makes me feel like a real class and I'm closer to my classmates. We all know that online classes are also real classes, but I love this idea that they still feel closer to each other and that they feel like they are in a real class um, through these projects and through telling their stories. Hey, we have been sharing stories, obviously, from our English and ESOL classes. We would love if this has, um, you know, help, helped you think of anything um, of how you might do this in your discipline. So we'll just take a moment and in the chat, drop in how you amplify student stories in your discipline.
Well, there's some really wonderful examples. And thank you to those of you that said you're here to find out. So that's why you're here. Um, but yeah, I just love any way that we're seeing how people are connecting student stories with their discipline, sharing stories um, in their history of photo classes, in their health classes, um, writing essays and demonstrating their knowledge that way. Um, I think someone mentioned animals and zoology. Um, how you can share oral family histories and for history, Marta's student project really alludes to that. Um, heritage stories in their race class. So thank you so much for sharing. There are so many ways, um, you know, that stories can be part of every discipline. And I just also love that um, someone put in the chat that just a photo, uh, one photo, there's a whole story behind that. So you can yeah. start really simple. So we had just a couple other examples here that we have learned from our own colleagues and seen textual lineage. So students telling the stories of the books and the texts that have impacted their lives, anything about the experience in their discipline, um, explanations and analysis. So instead of writing the explanation or the analysis of a content topic, they could tell that story, reflections, obviously. Um, any real life examples, and now we're seeing so many of them in the chat of how to explain course um, concepts. Um, and I love this idea Gail just wrote in there about story weaving. Wonderful, so many wonderful ideas. And when we incorporate video and student stories, it can be done in all modalities, whether asynchronous, synchronous, hybrid, on campus. And Denise and I have shared with you um, several different examples. Um, in synchronous courses, you can have the ability to orient them to the technology while you're screen sharing and answering questions live. So you have that benefit. Um, and student stories could be shared in Zoom breakout rooms. Um, that way it's not taking up the whole time of the whole group together. Um, and you can incorporate Padlets, Jamboards, or other, um, other tools to document their conversations. The Zoom chat could be a, a space for students to share their stories. In hybrid and on-campus courses, um, I, we have Chromebook carts at my college. So I've rolled in the Chromebook cart and get everyone on um, to get them logged in, get familiarized with the tech, um, record a short sample video um, and troubleshoot while I'm in the room with them. So that way when they leave, um, they feel confident to be able to finish the assignment on their own. Um, and I've carved out some class time for them to work on their videos. I've had students record videos um, instead of delivering oral presentations. Um, in my hybrid classes, one time I teamed up with another instructor who was teaching a similar unit on uh, family history and immigration. Um, and so on one day we brought our two classes together and um, showcased and watched each other's videos. So that was um, that was really fun. And so if you want to learn more about, um, especially the tool Adobe Express video, um, it's covered in the At One Humanizing Online Teaching and Learning course. There's an offering that's coming up in April. Um, and you can see the information here. It's three units, $85. And we'll share the link um, for you. And we'll also share the link to these slides too. Because we also have links <laughs> to many helpful resources on this slide. If you want to dig deeper and want to learn more about Flip and Adobe Express, there's some helpful resources here. And here's our contact information. If you'd like to reach out to us, we do have until 415 today. So um, we're happy to answer questions now. Um, Denise and I thank you all so much. And so I'll turn it back over to you, Michelle. Okay, that was fantastic. It, it's invigorating to me to just 
sit back and listen to student voices. Um, so I want to, you know, thank you for making that the focus of, of your session. That was really a lovely way to, to spend an hour. Um, really, really enjoyed that. I was just in the middle of answering a question in chat. Um, someone was asking about the humanizing course, and I'm, so I'm just going to answer that. The humanizing course that we, we put the link in the chat, um, it is open to anyone from the California Community College System, and there are no live sessions. It's completely asynchronous, um, which I think is what the question was about. It's a four-week course. We anticipate that it takes about 10 hours a week. It could be a little bit less. It could be a little bit more, depending on your um, experience with the technology and what your goals are for getting out of the course. Um, but we welcome you to, to dig into that course. And if you want to get some hands-on experience with Adobe Express, which used to be known as Adobe Spark. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to go over to the Q&A folks. Um, and I, I sorted these by by up the, the ones that are upvoted the most. So um, the number one question that folks would like to have answered is, can you talk a little bit more about how detailed your instructions are when using external apps like Adobe Express and Flip? Um, and yeah, if you want to address that. Well, for me, one thing I make sure of, especially with um, teaching ESOL students, is not to have too many different apps throughout the course of the semester so that we get used to one and that we just get all the kinks out at the beginning. So, for example, using Flip for a listening and speaking class, we do the first flip and we deal with all of kind of learning how to use it. And then for the rest of the course, then we can focus on the stories, the listening and speaking skills, pronunciation, the content, and not worry about how do I use it. So the very first time I do walk through step by step by step in terms of, for example, like um, for Adobe Express, how to create the account, like just one page on Canvas or in the classroom is like, just create the account. Everyone have account, everyone log in. Then the next one is like, now just click on create story or create video because there's like a web page, there's this and there's like, does everyone have the video? Um, and then we'll say like, add the first slide. And then there's a video on how to add the first slide. Don't worry about anything else, just the title slide, you know, and then step by step from there, then add, you know, your eight slides or whatever those are. Here's how you add the image. Then here's how you record, you know, just very much step by step. Um, supplemented, like Marta said, we have um, laptop carts at Miramar where we could bring them in and have students like troubleshoot and work together and help each other. I just started this last week in my classes and everyone had their own device. So some people were on phones, some were on their laptops, some had tablets and they were just all helping each other. But then when they go home, they have the added support of my video of how to do this so they can stop and start it and watch, you know, and do it as they need to. Um, and then it's for me, really, it's just the first time that needs all of that tech support. And then after that, the focus is on the content, the story, whatever we're working on, because they we've, we've worked on that. And I'm not throwing like a new tech tool at them every week. That's how I approach it, Martez. Yeah, so really similar, Denise. I think, um, you know, I'm really conscious of how many tools I use in my class. And I also want to, um, you know, if I'm going to make the investment in teaching you how to use a tool, I'm not going to just give you one assignment with it. We're going to do, we're going to keep using it, you know, because, because like Denise said, once you get over the technical hump, it's just about like the content and focusing there um, after the first one. So uh, may I make the first one really simple. Like the first flip is just introduce yourself. <laughs> just really simple. Could be like less than a minute. Um, so it's not so overwhelming. And then what, what I shared with you um, on the microaggressions flip, that's the second one. So they're already kind of, okay, I know this tool. I can get talking about, um, something more related to the course. So um, so they're doing, I think about five flips throughout my class. And then with the Adobe Express, they're doing it twice, first in, in small groups, and then the second when they're on their own. Excellent suggestions. I applaud all of those. And I I agree. In my the class that, that I that I teach history photo, uh, we use another tool called VoiceThread. But I have to just really underscore what you just said, Martez, about sticking with it, the tool, 
because once students get that self-efficacy and the confidence with using the tool, then they can really let their story shine even more, right? And because it's not about the technology, it's about what it is that you're sharing. So that's, I think that's really important. Um, and yeah. I've had, I've had yeah. students in my, I've had students tell me that um, they use Adobe Express for their own personal use now <laughs> because they know how to use it they're making um like photo videos just kind of like how you can do on on other apps but they use adobe express for that too just putting their personal videos on there creating a little movie out of it um so they use it for their own. now that they know how to use it they're like oh, okay and it's free um they find other uses for it um and one other thing i'll share too is that um for each tool i like to make a like a how-to video um, kind of walking them through each step so that they can hit pause, they can rewind if they need to and go at their own pace. So I think my students find that helpful. A great tip to add into our series about teaching with video. Thank you, Martez. Um, I also wanted to add that um, if anyone is interested, uh, a, a separate project that I'm working on, we just uploaded a brand new Canvas page into Canvas Commons. And it's titled Getting Started with Flip. And it just has, it's a single page and it's got little screenshots and it shows, it's intended for, for you to import into a class and share it with your students. Um, so if you log into Canvas, click on Commons in that far left uh, column and search for Getting Started with Flip, you can have access to that and, and use it as you wish. Um, okay, so let me take a look over at our Q&A. We had a couple of questions about images. So someone was a little confused about or interested in knowing more about when you're using Express, where do students get the images? So can you kind of just break down that interface and what comes along with the Express account? One of the coolest thing about Express is that when you are it's open and you have the slides or your web page or whatever you're working on there is um, a place to you click on add photo and then you can click to upload your own but then you also have all the adobe express commons photos and you can just search so you can type in beach or classroom or i don't know panda bear you know whatever you want and it will just show up there and then they those can be added directly into whatever you're working on you don't have to go outside um it's a great way to just keep everything within the um you know the one um tool um and i think someone was asking in the in the q a about like the scrabble photo or someone's photo that did look like one of probably one of the images that came through adobe express yeah um, if you have a student in your class who, this question has come up a couple different places, but if you have a student in your, in your class who um, is not able to speak, how would we accommodate that? So in one of the classes I teach is speaking and listening for ESL, but the other one, which is reading, writing, and grammar, um, I have had students who were very reluctant to speak. Um, not due to any challenges, they just didn't want to. So in order for them to complete the assignment, they just created the video, they added images, they added text, they added music, and the video still, um, you know, met the, um, the requirements of the assignment, right, without their voice, because voice was not actually a requirement of the assignment, it was the content of the video. So they didn't need to speak to accomplish that. So then we're just think, talking about uh, universal design for learning, right? Yeah. And giving students multiple options for exactly. expression. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, I've also had I've also had students um, do the text version without recording voice. Um, and if the student knows how to sign, then they can record themselves uh, signing and have the text as well. Mm. So there's different That's nice. options. That's nice. One more question. I'm going to ask Allie's question because um, it's a good one. How did students use Flip to narrate over an image? Is it an audio response and then that they added to the image too? Or was it a screencast of an image? Oh my goodness. Does, does I can't remember. It, yeah, it's not a screencast. So when you go in to flip and it's constantly changing. So I apologize, yeah. but every time I go in there, the interface looks slightly different, but you can, you know, it used to be automatically just be a video of yourself, but now you can upload, Eileen is saying that now you can upload the, a picture. 
So I have oh. students take the picture and then they upload the picture and then they just record in the pictures what's showing, not a video. That's a game changer. Yeah. Makes a yeah. really big difference. I didn't know yeah. about that option. Yeah, they keep adding so many different features in Flip. I mean, constantly, like it, just in the last year, they like did this whole upgrade. And now you can do so many things where you don't actually need to have your face on the camera at all. Um, and they have all these different backgrounds now. I mean, it's just the features are just growing and growing. Awesome. So we are at time. I want to thank both of you again for sharing, for making space for your, your student stories, but also for sharing your, your time with us and all of your colleagues. Uh, we had so much interaction here in the chat and folks, if you could click on reactions and share a reaction of, of your choice to just express how you feel right now, that would be wonderful. I love those. <laughs> those emojis they're just the best so fun all right so the archive of this session will be available again on the at one website within the next couple of days and folks again if you're here you're going to get an email tomorrow that's actually going to include the link straight to that page so look for that in your email tomorrow and it should answer um, all the questions that you have thank you again denise and martez and thank you everyone for being here with us today Take care, folks.